CPI numbers came out and everything is looking pretty positive. But the question you have to ask yourself is, is this sustainable? And how hard is the government going to come at us in the crypto and digital asset space? So welcome everybody. Today, I thought uh, I would get a little bit more extra information from a gentleman who's more in traditional finance beforehand and now is over in the crypto digital asset space. Simon Dixon, welcome back to the show. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, what a wild time with uh, banks failing and crypt and then them trying to blame it on crypto. So should be fun. It should be fun. I don't usually have co-hosts, but uh, I'll make an exception for Simon for sure. So if you don't know who Simon is, uh, he's got a little company called Bank of the Future. They've done some pretty solid investments that you can see, uh, mostly securities. Uh, but uh, also Simon was uh, an early investor into Bitcoin way back in the day, 2011, 12, somewhere around there. He also has a YouTube channel. I definitely want you guys to check out link in the description. So today, let's jump into it. CPI numbers come out. This is from uh, Ben's Twitter Twitter account, CPI 6%, estimation 6%, core CPI 5.5 in the estimation. So in all honesty, uh, the people nailed it. And we can just take a look here. CPI increased 0.4%, seasonally adjusted. It rose 6% over the last 12 months. Next release will be in March. And if we can just take a look quickly, we can see that over the years, CPI, not just not core, but just regular CPI has gone a nice little trajectory up. And if we strip out uh, food and energy, take a look at the core CPI, we can see it's even gone up uh, more vertically. And if we actually overlay that with the M2 money supply, we can see where things are going. And if we actually come down to a logarithmic, we can see just how much it is because we went from a nice M2 money supply of uh, 15 trillion, somewhere around there to 17, 18, 21 trillion. So what did this happen with the market? Well, you know already, we're almost at 1.2 trillion. Bitcoin's up 6%. Actually, over the last seven days, 15%. S&P 500 and NASDAQ is up today. So the question, this is why I got Simon here. Simon, is this sustainable? How far can we go? Or do you think that we're going to see more volatility for this year, just for this part? Yeah, well, um, it's the it's the, the so we got the six percent that the market was expecting. Um, the market took that very well after um, having a real big panic about what's happening with the safety of people's deposits at banks. Right. Um, and so, you know, typically, um, you know, it's not something most people factor in, but a, a bank crash is something that you do have to factor in. It's, a, it's probably one of the most deflationary effects you could possibly have. Um, and so we've been debating, you know, the um, inflation has really driven the need to put interest rates to a point that they're more competitive of a free market um, after trying to solve the last financial crisis by putting interest rates down to, um, you know, the, the markets that we're used to, which pumps lots of money into the stock markets. And yeah. Bitcoin's only been around during a, a quantitative easing cycle where you've had low rates as well. Um, so this was... The first time that we got to see, you know, Bitcoin really crashed as a result of um, putting up, uh, you know, rates to real real markets after uh, after the inflation that came out. Exactly. Um, and uh, and now we got to see, you know, what what Bitcoin was doing. And now because of the banking sector, you know, we started to see real economics, real fundamentals that people, you know, Bitcoin's always done well when people realize they don't own their money or they can't spend their money or their money's getting in def, you know, inflated away. Um, so we started to see that real use case, um, yeah. but we returned right back to our usual Ponzi economics. So what this highlights <laughs> to me is that there is no way of actually moving from a central bank market to a free market. Um, and when this experiment over the last year of yeah. trying to do that mm -hmm. immediately caused these really big effects, which we'll probably cover in the next section, um, these unexpected breaking of things. Uh, and when they break, there's no choice. You have to bow down to, um, you know, the, the Ponzi economics because you have to keep the market going. Um, yes. and, and we ha we will see that. So, um, you know, when the, the, mark, the rates were about to be hiked and they're probably going to be hiked to a lesser extent because they got some deflation effect uh, from mm. the fear of banking. Gotcha. So you know what? I just thought about some, and you just said it perfectly. Uh, as time has gone on, and we've seen now lately, we've seen you know Bitcoin have a nice little rally. Everybody and everybody would say that you don't understand. 
that the only time that crypto actually has gone up is because of you know, during the times of quantitative easing in its whole existence since Bitcoin was created. It was only about that. Well, now we are in quantitative tightening, are we not? And we've seen a little bit, bit of a run. Now, can we hit the all-time highs? I'm not for sure. Simon, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and this is the test, by the way. I break Bitcoin up to, into four-year tests. The first test was, um, can we survive centralization? Satoshi was mining a million Bitcoin, and he had to try and get it decentralized. It went from you know, mining on computers by yeah. one person uh, to a decentralized network over a four-year period when it moved, uh, started moving over to graphic cards and ASICs. The second cycle was um, surviving all of the regulatory crackdowns that we got then. FinCEN came and said, uh, came out and, uh, you know, the Mt. Gox uh, collapse led to Japan regulators and U.S. regulators and the China regulators. We right. survived that through the second four-year cycle. Uh, the third four-year cycle was surviving money printing within our own sector, which is the ICO boom. Um, and so everyone was creating tokens and could... Everyone was forking Bitcoin. Um, and so the third cycle was, does Bitcoin still have 21 million Bitcoin? And the answer is yes. Um, the fourth cycle, which is what we're uh, coming towards the end of, the third year or four, is the quantitative tightening cycle. So that's our big test. Can we survive quantitative tightening? And the reality is, as soon as you try quantitative tightening, um, you move back to quantitative easing. Um, so we may not actually get our test and, uh, you know, we may, we may not ever actually ever get to experience that. Um, the, the next cycle after that is what I call the CBDC cycle. We have to ah. survive Bitcoin and CBDCs. Mm -hmm. um, and then the cycle after that that I predict is the AI cycle where central banking is done by AIs uh, rather than humans. And Bitcoin proof of work is really the only force that can, that can combat that. So... That's what we've got to look for. These are all our big tests. So uh, I think we are going to survive the quantitative tightening cycle and put an end to that um, attack on Bitcoin. That's true. You know, and like it's it's weird because it's all coming together because like we, we talk about this, you know, Bitcoin would always, you know, about the, the money supply. But also they would say, you know, Bitcoin's never been through uh, a pandemic and we did just fine right there. And Bitcoin's never been through a war. Well, we went through the Afghanistan war for 20 years, and that's just just got over. Now we're in, uh, you know, globally, a uh, war on Ukraine. But the but the thing is, that things are doing quite well. The next question is, and this will lead us to our next point, which is the recession. And this is from Jim Bianco, and we talked with him yesterday. President Bianco Research really does great, great detailed work. He talks about, look, if we're taking a look at when the next recession is coming, we always take a look at the 10 and two year right? 10 to your treasury yields. And he says, look, just today, the two-year note declined 61 basis points. This was the biggest one-day decline since October 1st, 1982. And if we take a look here, this is what T notes or treasury bills are supposed to look like. It's not supposed to be an inversion. You're supposed to get uh, more money or more interest uh, on the 30 and the 20. But as time has gone on, it's become inverted. And now, of course, we look something like this, where it's like Frankensteinville and we're getting five, four percent for, geez, three months and six months. That's crazy. And of course, over here, we're going to see how it's actually fallen off uh, quite precipitously from five percent to four in the two year notes. So, again, Simon, I'm not a traditional finance guy. You come from that area. And when we get into talking about banks, because I know you try to start up your own bank beforehand. What does this mean for us as the two years have dropped down? Is it anything that we should be uh, looking at as positive or negative or it doesn't really matter in the long grand scheme of things? Um, yeah, I mean, this is what broke the banking system. The irony is, is that we're probably going to be told that uh, banks uh, were broken by crypto or um, high-risk venture capital with Silicon yeah. Valley Bank and Signature, and, um, but it was actually broken by the, the most risk-off asset treasuries. Um, so treasuries are essentially a way of lending to the government so you don't have to leave your money at a bank and you receive um, some yield on it um, because you know, interest rates have been so low, it's been negative yield. And really, you're just, you're parking money there, because if you leave it at a bank, you're exposed to what we're experiencing right now. Um, what happens when you, you know, you've got to, the, the, the cycle that we have to live through right now, after what, after how we solved every financial crisis, was you have to choose between inflation or recession, there's no other choice. Mm. Um, so you either put interest rates down in order to have a good market, which causes 
more money printing, more debt, um, and eventually inflation. And once inflation comes along, uh, you have to increase interest rates to send everyone that took on the debt bankrupt, mm. um, to send everyone that borrowed on their mortgages, put them out of business to cool the economy down. Um, and uh, what happened in this in this phase um, is, you know, they chose recession, um, and the central bank were choosing um, that. Uh, what that did is he, they spiked interest rates so fast, they um, at a faster rate than we've seen for like forty years. Mm. Um, that uh, it started to mess with the bond market, and so uh, what was happening at some of the banks that went bust, and this is the inversion that you uh, highlighted there. Mm -hmm. is that when banks are getting more deposits faster than they can lend, they, they end up like, a, like Silicon Valley Bank um, purchasing treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. Um, but they had a very, very low interest rate. So yeah. when they issue new treasuries or new bonds, um, and uh, you know, you're stuck with a 10-year bond with a very low interest rate, and then suddenly you can get a three-month treasury with a much, much higher interest rate, that crashes the price of the old bonds and you get that inversion, um, which is okay if you can hold them till maturity. But if you're suddenly, everyone's trying to take money out of your bank, you need to sell those securities in order to meet their demand. And uh, the, because if, you know, that means that you have to sell them cheap at a discount because the only reason someone's going to buy a bond off you with a very low interest rate when you could have a no one with a very high interest rate is if you give them a deep discount. Um, and that locked in the losses, which is what um, essentially moves a bank from illiquidity to insolvency. Um, and so the, it's a big, big problem. When you, when you have these, these inversions, it breaks things and it breaks banking. So yeah, it breaks it breaks things. It breaks banking. Do you see this as leading us into a potential recession, or do you see it as something else? Uh, no, I think um, again the choice is in the choice is recession or inflation, mm. um, and uh, it looks like by having this uh, this risk in the banking sector, they were going to choose um, mm. you know going back to inflation. Um, but, uh, you know, they, it looks like they'll roll over. There is a third choice between inflation and recession, which is create the illusion of a market, but take away people's freedoms more and more and more because more and more of the free market money ends up on the central bank. And then you end up where we are today, where the central bank dictates the whole economy uh, because no one will invest in stocks or take risk until the central bank decides that they're going to push out cheap money or buy those assets through quantitative easing. Um, so it looks like they were going for inflation and now they'll choose recession. That is interesting because that would lead us to our next topic, which we covered this yesterday. And we know that Silicon Valley Bank, they had an issue and it was around the bank. They did a lot, just like you talked about getting in treasury bills, which were uh, low percentages, but then of course they, uh, they were a little bit inverted. This came out, and I, and I really want to talk to you about this because you tried to start your bank as well. Signature Bank was seized to send a message to other banks that we don't want you dealing with crypto. Because what's this is actually uh, former U.S. Rep. Barney Frank said Monday on the board of the, of the bank. He says, look, he believes the state officials behind the action were trying to make an example. This was just a way to tell people we don't want you dealing with crypto. Frank told Associated Press. Frank co-authored the Dodd-Frank Act. And there was also another tweet where... Uh, other people, other parts of the government were reaching out to uh, different sectors of, of the banking uh, institutions and asking them, you know, what is your balance sheet like? How much have you loaned? And the third question that was being asked, this is just this is just hearsay. I can't prove it. But they were saying, do you have any exposure to crypto? So, Simon, since you've been in this position before trying to start your own bank, do you see this? And this actually just piggyback to what you just talked about, you know, the third option. So how dangerous is this right now? Yeah, so um, it's a bit of a, it's a bit semantics and it's a bit more complicated to make the connection. Oh, uh, but essentially, we, yeah, well, essentially with um, what we were trying to create in banking is a non-fractional reserve bank, which you could call a trust bank. And a trust bank just means you hold people's funds in custody. Um, and if they want to invest it, you treat it as a security. So people take risk with their money and they know what they're investing in. But when they don't want to take risk, they, they hold it, you know, as um, in custody, which means that you can't use it. 
um, you know, this is full reserve banking. With traditional banking, um, you, you, you know, you, you have to actually rehypothecate and you have to use right. people's money and you have to have a risk management model to manage all these risks. Uh, and when those risks go wrong, you end up realizing that actually a bank deposit is not as safe as I thought. I didn't understand the risk. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's why you have FDIC and the governments that come in and say, well, people shouldn't have to think about what the risks are behind. It's too complicated for people to understand. So we just guarantee it to a certain point so you don't need to worry about it. Um, you know, that's, that's the history. Um, but what I think we have set up actually here is we have seen firsthand, which I always um, predicted was, how the playbook of how you implement a central bank digital currency when you have a central bank digital currency. Um, because what the government and FDIC have essentially done is they've said, right, all these banks are contributing to this insurance fund. Um, and uh, if those, uh, if those, you know, when, when we do, when we take actions, we put up interest rates very fast to control inflation, mm -hmm. that breaks this particular bank. So it was, it was that that broke the bank. Um, the issue with, um, with, with Signature is how did all these fiat deposits come out? Well, in, in the case of um, you know, a, bit, a bank that was dealing with crypto, if you're dealing with all the exchanges, um, when they want to withdraw en masse, um, that's what caused it. It wasn't anything to do with the crypto. So it wasn't like the bank had a bunch of you know, tr traditional banking as you're managing your assets and liabilities. And uh, you have to bring in more deposits um, in order to be able to meet those demand deposits because you're investing all the rest. And so what, what they did with um, Basel requirements, and they said is if a bank is in using Bitcoin as an asset, so if you're holding it for your client, uh, then you need to have more deposits. And so if you were engaging, if you were a bank engaging with Bitcoin, you'd be bringing in all this Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin goes up, and that would mean that you'd have to have more deposits in order to meet those um those Basel requirements, a bit technical. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, this isn't, it wasn't the crypto <laughs> that broke banking. It was the management of assets and liabilities and treasuries um, and creating a unique risk model where people were wanting to withdraw fiat en masse. Um, and so we're going to get a big blame uh, for this, no doubt about it. That's why they decided to take those banks out. Um, but we, more importantly, we've just we've totally laid the foundation for how you would introduce a central bank digital currency into the economy. Um, and imagine if we had a central bank digital currency right now. What you could do is you could do exactly what they've done with Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, and Silvergate. Wait for them to go to under distress, um, and then give every customer a digital wallet and say, right, here's now your uh, your your balance. Mm -hmm. Let those banks go bust. We'll, uh, we'll auction off the assets just like they are right now to try and recoup some of those funds. And you can have essentially a central bank digital currency backed by the deposits of bankrupt banks. Um, and, and that's exactly how you would implement and transition from a world where banks create money based upon debt to a world where central banks create money which isn't based upon debt. Um, and that was actually what I covered in 2011 in the book um, and the importance of Bitcoin. And that's the reason why I found Bitcoin, because uh, we were trying to uh, explain that transition, that central bank digital currencies are inevitable, predictable, guaranteed. Um, and therefore, you need trust-based banking, but we couldn't create it uh, because of the crypto element. Um, so we ended up just finding Bitcoin instead, and, and Bitcoin just created an exit from the banking system. Ooh, scary resolutions. Yeah. So Simon, you talk about, I mean, that's great response, a great answer, but talk to us real quick then if, if is, it, is it inevitable then for CBDCs? Because it sounds like there is a group mentality. And when people realized they're like, wait, I can't get any of my funds out. Well, what do I do? Then the government steps in and goes, don't worry, we will assure every depositor will, will get their funds back. Okay, I like what I hear there, I get my funds back. Now is it just, just as, as simple as, the government just keeping their foot on the throat of all the small banks until they collapse. And then we just go into CBDCs and just bing, bang, boom, easy peasy. Or is there, is there any yeah. way out of that? Um, no, there isn't, there is not any way out of this in the end. It's just how many cycles are you willing to go through? Mm -hmm. um, 
eventually, you know, if you think about what's going to happen as a result of this, is they had to come in and guarantee the system, even though it seemed like it was insignificant, you know, small little banks. Yeah. Um, they had to guarantee the system because everyone else would start withdrawing. Now, what would they do? They'd put their money in treasury, they'd buy some Bitcoin, or they'd put their money in gold, or they'd just go to one of the very, very large banks. Um, and really, the beneficiary of that is uh, if, if, if everyone starts withdrawing their deposits and buying treasuries because they don't want bank risk, that's just a way of lending a load more money to the government from within your economy. Um, mm. And so the US government have found another way of rolling over their debt if that scenario uh, were to roll out. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, again, the, you cannot, it, it is structured as a Ponzi scheme. And so eventually you end up with, you know, in order to have more money, you have to have more debt. Uh, you can either get individuals to take on more debt, companies to take on more debt, corporate uh, governments to take on more debt, or you roll it over to um, the, the central bank. Now, remember, the central bank had the same exposure. The Fed has the exact same exposure as Silicon Valley Bank. Um, it, has, it is losing billions and billions of dollars every week. And we've got one, you know, about $1.3 trillion of losses right now. Um, so it is actually in the same trade as the Silicon Valley Bank, but it can roll it over. Mm. Um, eventually, inflation kicks in, and you end up at the end of a, you know, a, a switch of a world reserve currency. That's where it always ends, every single time. Um, one way of holding on to that is just issue a debt-free currency, which is the central bank digital currency. Which, uh, the cost of that is you take away everyone's freedoms and uh, privacy and everything that made America what it is today. Well, I got to tell you, if it wasn't for, for Bitcoin, where would we be? We'd be taking our cash out, putting it under, underneath our mattresses and hoping that they don't say, OK, that also becomes irrelevant. So, Simon, I got to tell you, that was scary. And I got And when I think about these things, there's only one really way out of it for the people who want to opt out. And that's Bitcoin. <laughs> And that's digital assets and crypto. Again, you can find Simon's channel here on YouTube. But Simon, that was excellent. Anything else you want to mention uh, as you've scared us all uh, pale? Well, it doesn't necessarily need to be too scary because you're highly unlikely to lose your bank deposit. You're just going to end up with sure. a digital currency. Um, you know, uh, but the, the, the thought of what that digital currency can do is just a management, you know, managing your expenses. Um, but... We are so fortunate for the one thing that protects us from everything, which is proof of work Bitcoin. If we didn't have proof of work Bitcoin, um, I can't imagine how much more um, challenging this scenario would be to manage. And I'm sure the stress that people outside of the Bitcoin world are going through, um, you know, it is is we we've just got this blessing and. There's no greater motivation to trying to, you know, really understand this than necessity. Um, and so we've now got a bunch of people that are really understanding the three things that help people get into Bitcoin, which is when you realize you don't own your money, when you realize you may not be able to spend your money, and when you realize it's going down in value and your savings are depleting over time. Um, and so we have Bitcoin, which was created to counter that. I can agree. And I think that's why maybe we're seeing a little bit of a, of a price. Maybe people are finally getting it when there's max pain. All right, Simon, I think we covered everything and good, we covered a lot, I would say, in 24 minutes. So, guys, uh, that is it. Again, you can find Simon Dixon's channel on YouTube. I highly recommend you uh, take a look and check out the videos. But that's it for today. Simon, we got to have you back on. Man. That was excellent. OK, thanks for having me. Nice to be the co-host. All right, guys, uh, like and subscribe all the good stuff, and we'll see you on the next one.